Great. I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar today, Special Needs and Sexuality. We have a really wonderful speaker, Jared Stewart. He is the Director of Programming at Scenic View. He's also currently the chair of the governor-appointed Utah Disabilities Council. He's the recipient of several national awards, including the National Educator and National Presenter of the Year. And he's been given a number of other regional recognitions and does um, many frequent presentations and keynotes. So we are very lucky to have Jared here to talk about a very important topic. Um, and Jared, I'm gonna turn the session over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sylvia, and, and thanks everybody for being here. Like she said, I mean, it's it's tough when there's good weather out there and when you know that the, the meeting is going to be recorded, it's a lot easier to be like, well, you know, I'll just, I'll catch it later. But thanks for being here and I appreciate your participation and hope this will be really worth your time because this is a topic I, you know, as Scenic View My School has been talking with the United Angels and everything, We've been saying, well, where could we collaborate? This was a topic that came up. And I have to say, this is probably the number one requested topic I'm asked to speak about nationwide because it is such an overlooked and critical topic. And so hopefully there'll be some useful things here tonight for everybody to be able to find some things that will apply to their personal situation. Um, yeah, as Sylvia said, I've got a lot of background. My background is primarily working with autistic adults so if you see this beautiful building in the lower left corner there, that's Scenic View Academy in Provo. Um, we're a residential school. We have 50 some students that live on campus and learn to work and to do social skills and academic skills and life skills, and then be able to move out into the community and live on their own. Uh, just worked out an agreement with Provo Housing that's gonna give us 30 autistic friendly uh, apartments here in the next year or so in downtown Provo. And so we're excited with a lot of the things that we have going on. Um, but in those times working with autism, and, and not just with my students, but with my son, um, I, have, I have a boy who's just turning 16, who's on the spectrum as well. Uh, this is a topic that comes up a lot and has caused probably more pain than any other obstacle that we've, we've dealt with. And yet it's also something that doesn't have to be scary and sad and bad and at all. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, I'm also speaking from personal experience. I am an autistic adult. I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome back when that was a thing and, and more recently with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and so today I wanna really take the time to talk about some of the whys behind this topic of sexuality, including exploitation and abuse, and then the what's. What, what are the things we can anticipate being challenges and how can we plan for that to be able to get ahead of it, to be able to maximize the chances for the people that we care about to have optimal outcomes. And that's really what I'm all about is can we maximize the potential of individuals with developmental disabilities? Um, and like I said, I'm gonna be focusing on the autism side of things a lot, but I, that's just my expertise and what we're gonna talk about can hopefully be very generalized to all kinds of developmental disabilities. But because this isn't my, my usual audience of, of autism families or, or exclusively autism families, I'm gonna just take a couple of seconds here to let people introduce themselves and give me kind of a feel for the room. If you wanna answer these questions in the chat, just everybody kind of type into the chat there a little bit about who are you here for today, right? So it says children, but if you're here for a spouse or yourself or whatever, that's wonderful too. But just what kind of ages, disabilities and concerns, right? So just ages, disabilities and concerns. Let's just take a couple minutes uh, and get a feel for who's here and, and what you guys are looking for today. And it says concerns for when they grow up. It could be current concerns. We have several parents here that have a child with Down syndrome, 15 years old, 20 years old, um, 12 years old, a 17 year old child with intellectual disability and a 16 year old daughter with Down syndrome. Wonderful. Okay, so we're, thank you, Sylvia, again, and sounds like we're kind of hitting that transition age, right? And 12 might sound a little young, but it's not at all. And so this hopefully will be really useful for you. We also have some parents here that have a child with autism, um, young adults age 24, 
an 18 year old daughter with uh, diagnosed high functioning autism and a 23 year old son that's um, with nonverbal autism. Great. Well, it sounds like we've got the spectrum represented here too. So that's wonderful. Um, in terms of biggest concerns, what are the, the big questions you're hoping to get answered tonight? If anybody has any of those, if you've got some, some things, and again, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, and, and my presentation may or may not hit them immediately, but I'm happy to discuss more at the end and even offline if that'll help. But just to get an idea of what are some of those concerns that people are facing. And if no one has a particular huge concern, you know, or, or a big question they're coming for tonight, that, that's great. That makes my job really easy. But, but uh, yeah, feel free to type some of those in. We have one response in the chat. My son's biggest desire is to get married and become a father. He has Down syndrome. Another mother worries that her daughter will be exploited. And she's very trusting. Yeah. Those are very common concerns I hear all over the country when I go and talk about this. And again, those are common concerns for any parents, but we know, right? <laughs> as, as individuals with disabilities, as parents of individuals with disabilities, we know that these are scary, scary topics, right? All right, well, hopefully that's a, a pretty good representation there, but I want you to see here this list of transition areas. Okay, these are areas that Every child, as they're moving into adulthood and getting ready to leave home, these are the things that we've got to prepare for as parents and as individuals, be able to deal with employment, education, integrating in the community, getting around that community, right? Transportation, handling money, handling social situations. And number six there, handling sexuality and personal identity issues and emotional issues. And then also planning for how to have fun and how life is gonna be enjoyable and full. And of course, sexuality actually impacts every single one of these areas, but it is the most overlooked transition area. So as I said, I'm gonna be focusing on the autism spectrum disorders, but please feel free to extrapolate and apply to your child. And I'm gonna be giving general advice, right? I mean, I am a behavioral psychologist. I am not your behavioral psychologist. I'm a person with autism. I'm not your person with autism or any other disability. So obviously you'll, you have to navigate the generalities I'm talking about and try and apply them to your person. But I wanna do two parts for tonight. First part, I wanna talk briefly about exploitation and abuse. And then I wanna move more towards sexuality education. So again, there were some concerns about exploitation, but have you guys seen any exploitation or abuse situations where you've had to learn some lessons the hard way that if someone would be willing to unmute their mic and maybe just share with the group? If we could get like even one person to maybe share something that they heard of or that they experienced, um, it's a very, very real concern. Um, in my area, it was a bus driver was exploiting children on the bus, so that was yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's going to, thank you, Megan, that's going to meld right into what I'm going to talk about. So it's real. It happens. I have never had a group yet that they didn't have multiple people who had experienced this stuff. And all too often, we don't talk about exploitation and abuse till it's already happened, right? What is exploitation? It's a form of abuse where one person is coerced into doing something for others' benefits and against their own self-interest. Exploitation is a really gradual process, right? It takes time for that person to be taken advantage of. Um, and the victim often isn't aware that they're being abused or exploited. And they may not even, they may refuse to recognize that. It has a lot of different forms and none of these forms are exclusive, right? So you can have all of these types of exploitation, right? You can have criminal exploitation where they're asked or forced to do something illegal. And drug trafficking is a form of that. Financial exploitation, we'll talk about a little more detail because that's really a common one. Labor exploitation, where people are kind of using them. Modern slavery is a more extreme form of that. But again, people with disabilities are more at risk for those kinds of things. Radicalization, we've all seen in the news. 
And it's, again, something that people with disabilities are more at risk for. And sexual exploitation we'll be focusing on a lot tonight because that's a huge deal and something that we can guard against pretty well. But these are not mutually exclusive, right? And so uh, one person may be involved in being exploited financially, but at the same time being exploited criminally. So uh, true story was talking with a family who had a son who was riding a public bus and he wow. uh, met somebody on the bus, was talking with that person. And they did, and the guy was like, oh yeah, we should be friends, right? We, you know, we really have a lot of friends. You know? and, yeah, yeah, we should be friends. He's like, well, you know, you're my friend. Uh, you know, you'll loan me some money for lunch. And the guy's like, oh yeah, sure. So he gives him, gives him the money in his wallet. And he says, you know, this is great. We get lunch. You know, we should, we should eat together a lot. In fact, you know, I know this great buffet in Vegas. We should get some money and go to Vegas. And he's like, yeah, yeah it's good. Words rent then. Exploiting me. And so then the next thing we know, he's, they're pulling up by a bank and the, the guy says, oh, hey, you know, hey, you're my friend. Why don't you run into the bank and you say, give me all your money and get some money from the bank and then bring it back to the bus and we'll go to Vegas and go to this buffet. And uh, long story short, you know, that ended in a trial and almost in prison for that, that poor exploit, trying to have a friend, but got financially and criminally exploited there. Um, so again, this happens all the time and there's so many other examples and I'm not gonna share even a hundredth part of the examples I could share with you guys today, but they're there. And so because exploitation is so common, and again, not just for people with disabilities, we need to know the signs of exploitation. What should we look for to see if our loved one's being exploited? And these are some of the things that show up in the research, right? That we notice that they're having relationships with controlling people or groups, that they've got unexplained things going on in their life, right? There's unexplained injuries or unexplained sudden financial growth or sudden financial loss or unexplained um, travel or changes in emotional or other behavioral um, issues, right? But they said, a lot of times people don't know they're being exploited or they don't recognize it, um, or they might see it even as a positive. If you're feeling like, well, I don't have any friends, um, and then someone comes along who claims to be a friend and wants to spend a lot of time with you, people may very well put up with that. Or they may say, you know what? Um, I want a friend so badly, I'm willing to do whatever this person's asking me to do, even if it's something against my values. So this is even more common, obviously, if the victim has been groomed or is, has been someone who suffered trauma in the past. We'll talk about those in a second, and then we're going to move on to some more clear examples of financial and sexual exploitation, because these are the ones I see the most. Grooming. Hopefully, again, if you guys were all in person, I'd be saying, hey, how many people know what grooming is? Um, can, does anyone know what a, can someone give me a definition of grooming if you've ever heard of this before as a topic? Just unmute your mic and maybe share a quick little definition of grooming. I guess in this um, case, it would be slowly gaining the trust of someone. That's a great definition. Thank you so much. That's really what it is, right? It's slowly getting into this person's trust, getting into this person's good graces and preparing this person to be exploited, right? So this is, this is what happens when any con person sees their mark and the con man's like, ah, oh, there's my mark, I'm gonna get them and here's how I'm gonna get them. But this is how people prepare people to be exploited is through grooming. And again, it, it's often associated with sexual exploitation but it, it can be any kind of exploitation. It doesn't matter, it's often associated with girls getting groomed for things but it happens to boys all the time too and LGBT and everybody else. So online grooming down there at the bottom is one of the most common ways that people are getting groomed, groomed through Instagram, groomed through Snapchat, groomed through so many of these apps. And it's just really sad and disheartening that every few years, you know, I, every time it comes on the news and it's like, you know, someone's been arrested for uh, having an inappropriate relationship with a, a young person or whatever. I'm always like, oh, please let it not be one of my students. And most of the time it's not, but every few years it's one of my students and it's somebody that maybe they were groomed and abused when they were younger and now they're grooming and abusing teenagers and, or other people. And, uh, you know, I just had a former student go to jail here uh, last month, which was really disheartening. But it's, it's just, again, this is, a, this is signs to look for, right? 
We want to see grooming. We want to recognize when it's happening and be aware that not everybody who wants to be friends and helpful with our self or with our person with disabilities that we're helping, they don't all have great intents. Um, trauma is another side topic. Again, this is, you guys know what trauma is, but trauma, when you've suffered trauma, uh, it can really increase your likelihood to be at risk for exploitation and abuse. And many people with disabilities, again, because of the, the social ostracization or the isolation, being bullied, having high levels of anxiety or anxiety disorders can make for a traumatic mindset and a traumatic personality, which then is easier for people to take advantage of with exploitation. And the research shows that people who have been tra traumatized are much more likely to have a lot of other issues as they get older. So again, if we can make sure that whatever treatment we're involving, that we can be aware that the person with disabilities has probably experienced a lot of trauma and have very trauma sensitive and trauma aware therapies that we're doing and treatments and interventions, uh, that can be really helpful in helping them to not only get through that trauma, but to also be in a better place to defend against the grooming, the exploitation, the abuse. Financial exploitation and sexual exploitation, the last ones I'll talk about, but again, financial exploitation, we've all seen this because this happens to our seniors. This happens to all kinds of people. When my parents, God bless them, moved down from Alaska to Utah, when, when they retired, they were within two years cheated out of their entire retirement money by very, very nice, kind people who wanted to help them invest um, and who claimed to be members of the same church they were part of, which nobody in Alaska would ever claim. And I mean, my parents are fairly smart people, but again, totally taking advantage of there. And we've all seen this. Financial exploitation can be as simple as that person on the bus saying, hey, you know, give me some money because you're my friend to um, even just things like having that person who only comes over because they just want to play your Xbox um, or somebody who is trying to become guardian so that they can get full control of someone's money. So again, knowing the signs of financial exploitation can be really helpful as you watch, uh, especially as the person starts having money, help them keep track of that money and help them see where it's going and help them be able to learn to budget and to be able to be aware of what's an even trade for things because sometimes it's like, oh, well, you know, this is my friend and my friend needs money. So I've got to give them money. And they just call me up a lot for money. And, but if I didn't give it to them, they wouldn't have a place to live. And very well-meaning, we all know our, our, our people that we work with with disabilities, such loving hearts, such giving, caring hearts. And if they've got something that someone else wants, boy, by golly, they've been conditioned to share their whole lives and, and to comply with other people's requests. So be aware of financial exploitation. Sexual abuse and exploitation, again, this is a definition I share with my students, but it, it's important to know what is sexual abuse and exploitation. I've had so many students who have said, when they've gone through this definition, like, oh my gosh, I was sexually abused. I had no idea that's what that camp counselor was doing. I, had, I knew it felt weird, but I didn't understand. And it's like, yes, please go talk to your therapist and you may need to talk to the police. Um, but it's, it's important to know what it is and that it's always a crime and it's never their fault, okay? Um, and so, that's one thing to definitely teach. But another thing for us to be aware of that is really critical that I've seen overlooked a lot, well, two things. First of all, this one, and this goes right back to the bus driver comment. Um, over half of those who abuse individuals with developmental disabilities have contact with their victims through some type of disability service with which they're involved. Again, whether that's a bus driver or a therapist or a caretaker or an in-home person or a teacher or whatever, and that is absolutely scandalous and unacceptable. So we often think it's, oh, it's stranger danger, but it's often the people they know, it's often the people that they have to work with professionally. And so again, being very aware, that's the first thing to wanna to point out. The second thing I wanna point out is what's called diagnostic overlap. If you look at the signs of sexual abuse, right? And then you look at the signs of disabilities or developmental disabilities, in particular autism, how much overlap is there? Right, so looking at this list of signs of sexual abuse, and this is from the National Sex Offender Public website from the Department of Justice. Go ahead and unmute. What are some of the some of the behaviors and some of the symptoms that you see here listed as signs of sexual abuse that are also symptoms and signs of your person's disability or your own disability? If you're a self-advocate.
Anybody out there working with somebody who has sleep problems or who seems mentally distracted or has strange eating habits or sudden mood swings or who acts in certain ways well below or well above their chronological age or who has body issues and body image issues or who has anger and depression or problems with relationships and closeness and friendships and constant anxiety sound like anybody you might know right so i mean if you look at the symptoms of autism but again if you look at even just some of the challenges of down syndrome or of um, idd or all kinds of things you're going to find some of these exact same symptoms and all too often what we'll see is that people attribute the symptom to the disability instead of realizing that wait a minute this may have come from, this might be something else, and, and that we need to be able to check that. And if our person's nonverbal, I mean, how are they supposed to even say what, what's happened or to express that? Or if they already have alexithymia, which again, a lot of people with disabilities do, where they're unable to express or identify the emotions they're experiencing, how are they supposed to ask or talk about it? So if you look at the overlap there, it, it can be scary sometimes. Don't let the overlap blind you, right? You know your person, you know, your, you know, so if you're seeing a change that you're like, no, this is not just the way they've always been. This is something different. It might be good to kind of dig into that a little and see, is there somebody hurting you? Is there something going on that makes you uncomfortable? And finding ways to communicate that with that person and help that person communicate that. Um, we'll talk more about refusal skills later, but those, again, are really important skills to have. Sylvia, I see the, the chat. Numbers keep going up. Is there anything in there I need to be aware of? Or um, we just have a comment in here about the sleep problems and um, maybe some social anxiety with friendship problems and how there's the overlap right there. Oh yeah, absolutely right. And how many people with developmental disabilities are they'd rather hang out with older people or with people much younger than themselves? How many of them have issues with? eating and swallowing or unexplained injuries or hygiene or touch or whatever, right? Um, I, I've known a lot of girls with autism who have tremendous anxiety about members of working with adult members of the opposite sex and they haven't been abused. But again, just based on the symptoms, it's like, oh, you, you seem like you've been abused just because you're this cautious. But again, being able to tease out what is the disability and what is not. Uh, is really crucial. So again, finishing up on abuse and exploitation, I want to talk a little bit about sexual abuse because again, people with disabilities are much higher are at much higher risk. My stats here are all for autism, right? Two to three times more likely to be abused or coerced or raped. Um, and we've got to watch for the grooming, pressuring from companions, that kind of stuff. But again, no matter the disability, the, the odds are higher and they're sitting ducks for people who want to take advantage of them. Know if there's a history of abuse because it makes them actually more at risk for future abuse. And know how to help them learn things like boundaries and how to express things and to deal with and put out the correct nonverbal communications, all of these things. Education is key, so that's what we'll be getting to. So again, just to end up part one here, as we're talking about sexuality and special needs, we've got to consider protection from abuse and exploitation first. Can we be safe, right? Can we keep ourselves safe? Can we keep the person who we're caring for safe? We need to know the kinds of exploitation abuse. We need to know the symptoms. We need to know some of the venues that it happens through. And we've got to be able to find ways to communicate, right? To ask the person, or if we're the person, to be able to get up the courage to say, hey, yeah, this happened and I don't feel good about it. We need to proactively get in front of this and teach things. Again, like functional communication, to be able to express ourselves and to say no and to be able to tell someone if we've been hurt or taken advantage of. And then we need to be able to learn sexuality concepts and we need to learn them on our level and in a way that can make sense to us. And so that is just my plug for part two here because we're gonna move on into that. But again, and any final questions, comments or concerns with exploitation and abuse? I know I went through that really quickly, but I, I just wanted to raise that and make sure that that's the context for understanding of one of the main reasons we wanna talk about this. It is not the only reason but it's one of the main reasons and probably the primary thing to start with is the safety piece. But any questions, comments there? 
Okay, we'll move on to part two. And we'll, again, like I said, we'll have Q&A at the end as well. Let's talk about sexuality education, right? What we don't know can hurt us. And if you get nothing else out of this presentation, regardless of who you're working with, regardless of how old they are or what their abilities or disabilities are, what their functional level is, ask yourself, what can I do? What is the best way that I can incorporate healthy sexuality into my interventions and teaching with this person? Because that's what's gonna create the safety and the future that that person needs and deserves, okay? I'm gonna try to share a video here, so hopefully y'all can hear this. Um, this is mainly just for laps. This is a, a Big Bang Theory clip, but I want you to watch. Here's quote unquote, Dr. Sheldon Cooper. If you've never seen Big Bang Theory, I get sent clips all the time. And here he is with his Caltech PhD at a children's bookstore trying to learn about social skills and see if you can spot the problems here. Coping with the death of a loved one. My condolences. Thank you. Family or friend? Family. Too bad. If it had been a friend, I'm available to fill the void. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as well she smelled like mothballs. <laughs> Do you have any books about making friends? Um, yeah, but they're all for little kids. Hmm. I assume the skills can be extrapolated and transferred. Uh, I guess they're right over there by the wooden train set. Oh, I love trains. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> oh, my, that's awfully sticky. <laughs> All right, let's see. Bernie Bunny has two daddies now. <laughs> Probably about homosexual rabbits. <laughs> Jerry the gerbil and the bullies on the bus. Reddit not helpful. <laughs> oh, well, here we go. Stu the cockatoo is new at the zoo. <laughs> Author Sarah Carpenter lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana, with her husband and best friend Mark and their cockatoo Stu. Probably makes her an expert in making friends, wouldn't you agree? I don't like birds. They scare me. Me too. Most people don't see it. <laughs> what are you reading? Curious George. Oh, I do like monkeys. Curious George's monkey. Somewhat anthropomorphized, but yes. <laughs> Say. Maybe sometime you and I could go see monkeys together. Would you like that? Okay. Sheldon, what are you doing? I'm making friends with this little girl. What's your name? Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. I'm your new friend, Sheldon. No, you're not. Let's go. We were really hitting it off. Uh, don't look up those cameras. <laughs> okay. And again, please don't be offended. I just, I like using that as an example and I like playing it for my audiences. I, I teach uh, sexuality at my school, but also at Utah Valley University for the freshmen who are on the autism spectrum who are part of the Passages program. And when I ask them, why is it don't look up there's cameras? I get really fascinating responses because most of them don't know. So somebody go ahead and unmute. Why is it don't look up there's cameras? What, are, what is wrong with everything Sheldon's doing here? He's definitely trying to make a friend and it's inappropriate as he's an adult and the child's, you know, play area, not play area, the children's reading area. So it looks really, really suspicious. And it oh, yeah. comes from a good place for him, but he doesn't recognize it as something that could be harmful. Exactly. Thank you so much. That is exactly right, right? I mean, here's a guy who, if, if you know anything about the show and the character, he's completely asexual. He has no interest in this stuff. He's not a threat to anybody, but he's going to get himself arrested here. Okay. I, I got a call from a lawyer not too many years ago uh, who said, hey, can I get your help with the trial? I said, what's going on? He said, well, I've got this individual with autism and he's married, has a job and works, works as a computer programmer and he likes to play video games and he was in a video chat room on this video game that he was part of and he was chatting with somebody else who was there another player and the player said oh i'm a, I'm a 
14 year old girl. And he was like, oh, okay. And he was thinking to himself, man, you know, this is maybe not the best environment for a 14 year old girl. And as he's getting, so he's kind of watching out for her and he communicates with her a little more and she starts saying some stuff. It's a little more kind of forward. She's wanting to like meet people and stuff. And he's like, oh, someone needs to help this poor girl. So he arranges to meet with this 14 year old. Okay. You know where this story's going, right? So when he gets there to meet this 14 year old girl that he's going to have a talk with and try and help her out. It, it's of course, it's the police. And he gets thrown in jail and they won't, you know, the fact that he's autistic was not even on their radar. They did not care because if you're an adult male seeking out a relationship with a 14 year old, no excuse is going to matter. His wife, his parents, everybody around him testified like, no, no, this is not who the guy is. He's just trying to help. And thankfully we were able to get it down to just time served and that's all he did. And he didn't have to uh, even go to trial all the way, but it was scary stuff. Again, even with the best of intentions, we have to know it. Even with people who are, because I'll, I'll have students who are like, oh, I'm just going to stay away from that sex stuff. That's just yucky. And I'll just never do that. And it's like, okay, right. I'm like, I believe that. But some of them I do. They really are asexual. And it's just not a thing for them. They still have to know. We all have to know. It's a protection thing. There are so many errors. And like, like our volunteer said, he's, he's not even aware of the nonverbal implications of being in a children's section or of looking at these you know, children's books or talking to someone who's that much younger than him didn't even enter his mind. Got a call from a UVU student who had just gotten out of prison because he'd gone up to Salt Lake and gone to a club. And at the club, he'd met a girl and they'd gone home and had sex. And it turned out that she was only 17 and he was 22. And he didn't know. He's like, well, why'd they let her in the club? You know, you're supposed to be 21 to be in this club. And so she lied about her age, that's on her, but he went to jail and then he came out, he was trying to get back into school and now he's on the sex offender registry and nobody would rent to him. So again, I mean, you've got to know this stuff, regardless of wherever they fall with their values, regardless of wherever they fall with their development, regardless of their cognitive level, regardless of any aspect of ability or disability, this is critical stuff. And I know it's not a comfortable topic. The fact that you guys are here on a Friday night, that's, again, my hat's off to you. I would, I would much rather be other places if I were you. But we have to talk about it, right? Um, the very first ever mercy killing, and I hate to use that phrase, uh, for someone with autism was Dougie Gibson, whose father shot him after he was caught publicly masturbating. And his dad just did not know how to deal with this. And so he took Dougie out for his favorite playground and to his favorite McDonald's and got him his favorite meal and got him down to his nap and wrote a note and said, I know there's no forgiveness for what I'm, for what I'm going to do, but I don't have any, I don't have any other recourse and I have nothing I can do about this. I don't have the health to be with him. And he, as he gets older, I just can't handle this. And he shot Dougie. And that was just 50 years ago. Uh, we've come a long ways, but it is critically important. People are born sexual. They're going to be, whether we want them or not, we're born that way. We're wired that way. People are going to become adults. Funny thing about kids with disabilities, they grow up to be adults with disabilities, and they're going to have to face adult decisions. And if they make poor decisions, it can create massive problems and pain. But if they make good decisions, it can be a tremendous source of fulfillment and peace and happiness. And it is just a critically overlooked piece of transition, like we were talking about, right? Because the real scandal here is that most people with disabilities don't get any education sexual about sexuality until after they've already messed up. That's when someone finally tells them, oh yeah, by the way, there's all this unwritten sexual rules here. Oh yeah, by the way, there's this whole aspect of human existence that nobody covered in any of your classes and nobody put into any of your transition plans and nobody ever talked to you about because we were too busy just getting you to potty train and we were too busy just trying to get you to be able to dress yourself and be able to talk to people. But it's critically important because we can't wait till it's after they're arrested, right? What we don't know can hurt us. And when it comes to sexuality, I've seen it over and over hurt people. There are so many myths out there about sexuality education and disabilities. And again, I'm gonna use autism here, but this, this is broadly for everybody, right? People with disabilities, oh, they have no interest in sex, okay? So they're, they're, un, they're asexual or hyposexual, or no, 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 they're overly fixated on it. And if you tell them about it, man, they're just gonna be, completely uh, hypersexual. People with disabilities are all heterosexual. That's not true at all. Um, I can't give them sex ed because you know that'll just give them ideas. Or I can't give it to them because they, they won't understand it. They're too complex and too nuanced and too social. 
or, and I hate this one, if we don't teach them anything, they'll never become sexual and they'll never, never, never need to know it, right? Here's another myth. Children with sexual behavioral problems will grow up to be sex offenders. In 98% of cases, or 97 point something, it is not true, according to the research. Kids grow out of that and they get the right education and they, they're not that way. So even if a kid has sexual problems as a kid does not mean that's always gonna be that way. People with disabilities shouldn't date or they, they're never gonna have successful romantic relationships. They should never get married, never have kids. So we shouldn't teach them any of this stuff anyway. They'll never need to know it. Again, garbage and I really hate that stuff because the truth is people with disabilities are people. And all people are sexual beings with the same hormones and urges. They're exposed to the same media. They have the same decisions to face. They have the same hopes and dreams. The truth is that people with disabilities are all unique and they're all gonna have very unique take on sexuality and on their interest levels and all of their activities and behaviors, but they all are gonna have it, okay? As they look through the research, it's not that far off of the quote unquote neurotypicals, right? If you ask people with disabilities, are you going to get married? Most of them say yes. And I like one of the parents said earlier, they've got a child who their dream is to get married. Well, there's no separate set of dreams. Okay, Dr. Eric Carter does a lot of research on this stuff. And he'll tell you, this is the tragedy is, is that people with disabilities are so neglected and so marginalized in society, that they have the exact same needs and wants and dreams of going on and getting married. Every little girl is still watching the same Disney movies where it ends, at, you know, the end where the princess marries the prince. And they want to be that person someday, right? The truth is, is that because of disabilities, people with disabilities may have sexual feelings that are out of sync with their level of social emotional development awareness or their chronological age. But the truth is, is when they hit 18, the world's going to judge them by their chronological age, not their developmental age, not, you know, their appearance is what's going to create the difference there. And so we've got to prepare them for this as the best we can and at their pace and speed. Okay. Um, this is more stuff about autism in, in general, but again, just wanting to point out some pieces here that the people with disabilities, uh, they tend toward extremes of behavior, either being, you know, not terribly interested in sex or very interested in sex. Those are stereotypes because there are people who really fall into that. Um, someone who is, uh, a girl with a disability who decides to become sexually active will often have an all or nothing thinking that just says, oh, well, I should just be sexually active with everyone, or this is how I get boys to like me. And I really like the social attention I'm getting and the social power I'm getting, and I'm just gonna do that. The same with boys who become sexually active. And this is true for those who are LGBT as well. Um, and those who are disabled are much more likely to experience gender dysphoria or to identify as another gender completely or to want to transition um, or to identify as bi or as lesbian, gay, all of the above, right? Um, or to try out several of the, these identities as they come to understand who they are. So again, these, this, is, this is what the research is, although we need a lot more, right? One of the other things that shows up constantly in the research is that teens and adults with disabilities do not have information about sexuality compared to their peers, and they don't have peers that they can talk to about it, right? Most people, if they have a question about sex and they don't feel comfortable talking to their parents or somebody, they're going to talk to a friend, right? What do our kids end up doing? Where do they go for information? Online, I don't know. Online, and actually, again, this is happening more and more for the non-disabled kids too. Online is the absolute worst place to go unless you've got someone guiding you to get information. I had a student who he um, was just trying to put together a slideshow and he typed in girls having a good time and it led him down a Google image rabbit hole that ended up with him having child pornography on his computer, even though he's not into that stuff. And thankfully we were able to help him understand the severity there and, and get rid of that. But again, it's, it's just not a good place to go. Another thing that happens is people with disabilities end up engaging in behaviors that people think are, oh, this is a perversion, this is a deviance, when really they just didn't have any knowledge or they didn't have anybody tell them what an appropriate way to express themselves was, right? And even those who have good language skills, they may even be able to talk about sexual concepts on a really high level, and it doesn't translate to knowledge and behavior very well. We've had so many students who can come through and even tell you all of the things you're supposed to do to protect yourself against getting raped, and then they'll call us up a few years after they graduate and say, I got raped. And they can look back and see like, oh yeah, I, I missed all the signs. But it, again, that's 
that's hard, but they can get better too. And I, I will tell you that. Bottom line, teens and adults with disabilities have exceptional needs and exceptional challenges because they're exceptional people. And that's true of sexuality, education, and as of anything. There are five areas to emphasize with sex ed, okay? You need accurate information. You need to help the person develop their own personal values to cultivate their social competencies so they can have good relationships and healthy relationships. They need to be able to discover their identity at their own developmentally delayed pace. And they need safety skills and be able to practice proactive safety. No one's ever gonna be 100% safe and there is a dignity of risk. We wanna let people assume risk, but we wanna prepare them for that risk, right? So that they can be self-advocates and they can be safe. So these five areas are really, really critical. Again, the tragedies, there's just, we're much more likely, those of us with disabilities to engage in harassment or stalking behaviors, to get involved in pornography or public sexual behaviors or get abused, right? Why? Because language and communication pro problems, problems creating friends or, or being desperately lonely, having environmental deficits where we're never really around people we could possibly date or have healthy relationships with, not understanding public versus private or reality versus fantasy, being able to take those learned skills and generalize them to new environments is hard. Um, and again, as caregivers, we're trying to balance what is that risk that's acceptable, you know, based on their rights as a person. And obviously law enforcement dealing with police officers is a huge deal and that would be a totally separate presentation, um, but we need to be able to train them for that too. Also complications from negative body image, difficulties interpreting other people's facial expressions or their intentions, um, lack of romantic experience or opportunities. Again, if you're in an all boys school or an all girls school or you're just in a, in a uh, self-contained classroom, it can be really hard to, to have any kinds of opportunities. And then things like anxiety and depression can make things worse. Autistic fixations and perseverative behaviors, that can also make things worse, especially if uh, they end up in things that the world can consider to be just a bit off into the um, kind of perversion area. Lots of reasons for this. Again, depending on the disability, there's so many of these. Um, but one of the biggest ones is that bottom one there, right? Social isolation and loneliness can become desperation. If we're not helping them learn happy, healthy, positive, proactive social skills to be able to form meaningful relationships, they're going to try and seek them out another way because that's how humans are wired, right? Um, Jerry Newton, she talks about her, her clients and she says, many of my clients have told me that having sex with someone is the only time they feel normal. They have a job that they know a normal person wouldn't have. They can't drive. They're not free to go where they want when they want. They always have to tell someone where they are and who they're with. They feel like they're treated as a child. Yet when they're sexual with someone, they're just like everyone else, a grown up. I've received the same message from people with identified IQs from 30 to 130, verbal and nonverbal. And I've heard the same thing over and over too, right? So much of you see on TV, you see in the movies, this is what normal people do. And they want to be normal too. And suddenly somebody wants to be with me. Sure, for me, that sounds, that's pretty attractive, right? Another huge reason for the challenges of sexual abandonment, like we talked about, this is where we tend to never get around to talking about sexual topics or to teach and train. No information can often be worse than wrong information. Um, we had students who, when we were talking to them about trying to assess their level of sexuality knowledge, like, oh yeah, yeah, I know where babies come from. Really? Okay, how does that work? Well, so the guy pees in the girl's belly button. Oh, okay. Well, that's not quite exactly what, how it happens. But, you know, again, just things that people didn't, we had, I had a student who was 26 years old and was the child of a doctor, a medical doctor, and did not know that boys and girls had different sexual organs. So again, we've got to do it because if you have no information, you're going to get the wrong stories. You're going to feel guilt and shame and that you don't need to feel. And we need to understand that you're not going to healthily repress or ignore sexuality. We need to direct it to appropriate expression. And that's critically important. So I know, again, we've only got about 15 minutes here. Uh, so I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here. And again, you're going to need to customize this to your person. But I really hope that, again, you're getting this picture of why this is so critical. And here's a list. It's on your handouts. These are things to know. Proper and slang names of body parts. Why you need to do slang names? Because the rest of the world knows them and they're going to use those words. And if you don't know them, you can be made a fool of or you can get yourself into trouble. I mean, poor Sheldon is talking to this girl about going to see monkeys. When someone listening to that might be like, oh, that's a euphemism for penises because monkey is a euphemism for penis. So, I mean, again, even slang names, we will do a day in class where we put up posters and say, all right, 
just for today and today only, here's the proper name of the thing, write every word you know that means that same thing. And it's shocking how many people don't know things or how many words I learned, but they got to know the proper function of body parts. They've got to know about um, growth and development. I met so many girls who didn't know anything about their menstrual cycle until they started it. No one had ever told them to expect it. And all of a sudden they're bleeding. They had no idea. They've got to know about personal hygiene and self-care in those areas. They've got to know about pregnancy and birth control and disease. Uh, they've got to discover their personal values. We'll talk more about public versus private. They've got to know emotions, impulses, attraction, and personal sexual identity, social skills, dating skills, peer refusal skills, and advocacy skills, understanding personal space and boundaries, good touch versus bad touch, being able to prevent abuse, to avoid harassment. Um, Masturbation is a huge issue, internet and phone safety, pornography addictions, healthy sexual relationships. Most people never get to number 20, right? <laughs> like We're lucky if we can get to the others. They don't have to be all at once. They don't have to be in great detail. It's as simple as, hey, we're taking a bath together and you know, I'm bathing you while you're a kid and we're gonna point out some body parts while you're showering or while we're bathing. Or, you know, hey, there's a, your body's gonna be experiencing a change here. Have you experienced any of this stuff? Or wow, notice your emotions here and, and how this, this did this. What are, what's going on there and how can we process this? And that emotion, we could call that this, right? It doesn't have to be big. It's the simple in the natural environment things even that are wonderful teaching opportunities if we're aware and ready to teach sexuality stuff. And then there's the unwritten skills like flirting that can get people in trouble and those are good to learn too. And everybody needs to know them and I'm not gonna show you this Studio C video, but you can look it up if you want or you can just watch it on the PowerPoint. As you are giving this instruction, as you're going through these areas of instruction, make sure you're matching their developmental level, right? And not just their cognitive or emotional level, but their physical level, right? I, working with uh, girls who were cognitively very young, but had developed very attractive bodies by the world's standards. And boy, oh boy, all the boys were suddenly paying attention to these girls and they had no idea. And they didn't know why they were even supposed to be wearing a bra. Um, Learning styles, how do they learn and remember best? Think about the ways you teach them now that worked to teach them potty training or to teach them to talk or to teach them anything you were trying to teach them to get dressed or whatever. How did they learn? Use those same methods, right? Values, they need to start knowing their values. You can teach them your values, especially to start with, that's great, but help them again develop their values and know what their rules are gonna be, but also the values of the culture around them. Their goals, their visions, and their realities, right? What do they really want in terms of relationships? but also what's their probable future situation. And don't underestimate, I've, I've seen people with all kinds of disabilities become happily married. So again, don't underestimate, but again, help them prepare for the realities as well of their situation. Let's look at values for a second because this is critical, right? They need to know what a value is. And a lot of times they've never been asked, you know, well, what do you expect of your best self? What are you looking for in a friend? How do you want to be treated by somebody? How do you want to treat them? What are you looking for in, a uh, husband, a wife, a sexual partner. What are your values? What are gonna be the limits in your, in your relationships? What do you think is morally okay or not okay, right? And to seek people out for relationships who share those values and to respect other people's values, it's very easy for them to be judgmental. I know my autistic son really will struggle sometimes with people who don't follow what he thinks values should be and being able to teach him to be more flexible and accepting is, is different. Um, Again, so these slides, I'm just gonna fly through again. You can go back to the slideshow and you can look through all of these. You can email me if you have questions, but again, knowing what your body is doing and why your body's doing this and making this very just concrete, clinical, calm, real, no shame associated with any of this, no matter what your kid brings up for, for sexual stuff, questions, whatever, no shame. Uh, thank you for talking to me about that. This is great, let's discuss that. Or you know what? Yeah, that's gonna, let's talk about this piece of that because that's going to be more important for you to understand right now, whatever it is. You can use visuals, you can use social stories, there's links in the, in the handouts to things. Again, you're going to use the same teaching techniques you use for anything. Uh, they need to know about friends and how saying someone's a friend can mean different things if that person is an acquaintance versus someone who you have to be around versus someone who you really hang out with on your own versus someone who you might have a romantic relationship with, right? So what are those levels and how do you know someone's a friend and how do you know someone's not a friend, right? And then how do you know someone's a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a romantic, right? Helping them to avoid celebrity syndrome. So many of them only want to date or, you know, be around people who look like the people on movies and TV. Um, teaching them to be able to reach out in a respectful way and to watch out for red flags, okay? 
looking for healthy relationships where there's honesty, equality, adequate and appropriate time for the level of friendship, where you've got mutual support and respect, where you're able to talk about things and that you have total trust and being able to recognize those relationships that are healthy and unhealthy, right? Knowing that identity is a huge piece and it's gonna be delayed for people with disabilities generally to figure out their identity, but also realizing that there's a lot more to identity than just sexuality or, or gender expression. Any of those things are just one piece of identity. Sexual identity is, you know, biology and genetics, along with arousal patterns, the experiences and the situations they're exposed to, and the personal values. And all these things are going to coalesce to create a sexual identity. And what I tell my students is, yeah, you need to be aware of some of these concepts, especially as you get older. And again, when you're a little kid, it may be as simple as saying like, oh yeah, some people are like that. Some boys like boys or whatever. Um, as they get older, they may need to know a little more. But one of the things I tell my students over and over again is, look, you have a developmental delay. That means you don't need to rush any of this. You don't have to figure out every aspect of your identity. And you certainly don't need to take one aspect of your identity and, and make that your whole life right now. So keep finding out who you are. Who could you talk to about that? How could you work that out? What are some things you can do? And what are some activities you can engage in that are gonna help you to be able to know yourself better in every aspect and in every way? They've got to know about contraception and STDs. Um, it's really critically important. And what are you going to do for birth control? Because if someone becomes pregnant, that changes everything, right? Um, how do you prevent STDs? What's the difference between public and private? Um, Again, I could go on so many stories on that one. Oh, internet safety. This one's key. We have whole classes on internet safety. We have a, a lot of one-on-ones on internet safety. And this is still where, this is where our students get in trouble. And sexting is just really common. If you have, if, you're, if your child has a phone, they're probably being asked for sexual pictures if they're a girl, okay? And they may have already sent them too. So again, be aware of that kind of thing. I remember one girl uh, in my healthy sexuality class and we were talking about sexting a little and, and she was like, we were talking about, you know, being asked to send pictures. She's like, is that what that means? Oh, I had this guy and he asked me like, hey, send pics. You're cute. And I'm like, pics of what? I'm like, so what'd you do? She's like, well, I was like, well, I like pancakes. So I'll just send him a picture of the stack of pancakes I had for breakfast. And she sent him this picture of a stack of pancakes. And I laughed so hard. And I was like, you do that. Whenever any guy asks you for pictures, just send him a stack of pancakes. Um, but again, this is where you can get into trouble. I've had students end up in jail because they were sexting with someone that they didn't realize was underage. Um, and it's also really easy to fall for stuff that they read on the internet or as people on the internet try to catfish or whatever else for them, right? You only know what the person on the other side of the screen wants you to know. And predators are really good at telling you exactly what they wanna hear. If you do meet someone online, which can be a great way to make friends or a great way to meet someone, make sure you're meeting in public at a reasonable hour, you've got somebody with you, you're taking care of your own transportation, et cetera, okay? Harassment and stalking are key because a lot of our students will get fired because they said the same joke to Mary that somebody else told Mary. But when that guy told Mary, she laughed. But when I told Mary, she called HR. Um, and knowing that harassment is about unwelcome advances and intimidating and offensive stuff. Um, stalking, stalkers tend to be people with disabilities and being able to help people be more cognitively flexible there. There's some things you can do about stalking and harassment, uh, lots of different types of therapies, but even uh, some types of medication, but even just helping to decrease social isolation and exposing people to more friends can be really helpful. Boundaries and boundaries training on all the different levels of boundaries, what it looks like, what's appropriate touch in these levels, all of that kind of thing. How to know if someone's interested in a relationship with you and how to let them know if you are with them. Um, what to do if somebody asks you out, you know, do you want to go or not? You don't have to say yes. In the three strikes rule, I'll teach to my students that like, hey, if you ask someone out and they make an excuse, oh, my grandmother died, I, I'd totally go out with you, but my grandmother died. And then you ask them again, they're like, oh, I'd totally go out with you, but I have this huge test. And then you ask them again, they're like, oh, I'd totally go out with you, but you know, my dog is sick. They're done, okay? Three, three strikes, no matter what they said, they're not, that, that's done. Just give them space now. Training them how to de decline things, to turn things down and to remember, no means no, right? But also that it's okay to say no. So many of our kids, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a BCBA, I understand. We teach compliance, right? But if all you know is compliance, you're a sitting duck. You also got to be able to say, you know what? Sometimes it's okay to say no, and it's all right. I'm gonna, and that's all right not to always share. Consent has to be taught, right? How critical their consent is and others' consent. Being able to teach them to refuse reciprocity. Someone offers you a gift or offers you to be your friend, you don't have to respond to that, right? 
and to evaluate reciprocity. Oh, Jimmy's going to sit by me at lunch. And so I gave him my Xbox, right? Again, it can go right into exploitation. Uh, we will not watch this video, but you can watch it if you want to. Now, inappropriate behaviors I want to touch on briefly. Oh my gosh, we're out of time. Sorry, it's hard to judge on these virtual ones sometimes. There are a lot of techniques out there for dealing with inappropriate behaviors. This is my personal technique, but again, determine the context, explore the causes, and then come up with interventions that will help alleviate that behavior. Um, again, the best strategies tend to be differential reinforcement, but it can be a lot of different things. Dr. Tarnai has a great list here. Again, you can review this stuff, um, but making sure you're being ethical, that we're not just denying them sexual experiences because we're worried or scared, but that because we're also trying to do the very best for them and help them reach their potential. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about masturbation. Masturbation is the number one sexual issue that people with disabilities end up getting in trouble for. Uh, but regardless of values, masturbation is a normal human behavior. It is the most common behavior reported by adolescents with autism, but also all adolescents. And public masturbation is the top reason that people with autism get arrested. I don't know how that is for other disabilities, but it's high. Um, a lot of times it's just sensory stuff. It may not be masturbation at all, or it may be that they had an erection and they didn't know what, what to do, and they're trying to just cover it up. And my body started doing this, and no one ever explained what to do when I have an inconvenient erection. And now the bus aide is saying, oh, he was touching his penis, and, and we got to get him busted for this. So masturbation, again, is a really complex issue. You need to know what are your values, okay, and what are their values, and they need to know what's okay and what's not okay and where that's okay or not okay. And again, this is very personal stuff. If the person's having problems with masturbation, there are ways to intervene. Here's one. But again, masturbation issues can get better with age and with treatment, they, they don't have to be there. Simple social stories like the no hands and pants story here, which is in your flyer and again, you can find others, can be really simple social stories and ways to talk about that stuff. But if you're dealing with inappropriate sexual behaviors, that's what ISBs are, you wanna be able to act early. Always be thinking, what are they going to need five years from now? What are they going to need to have five years from now? And get plans in place, work on the environment, reinforce appropriate behaviors. Don't shame negative behaviors, but reinforce the heck out of appropriate behaviors. Be really consistent. Aim for skills that they can use, not just at your home, but throughout life. I mean, I've seen so many young men with autism who they've been raised their whole life with well-meaning girls who are all of their aides and, and RBTs, and they taught them to use the bathroom, but girls, I don't know if you know this, guys do not pull their pants down to their ankles when they use a urinal. But I'm meeting these adult men with autism who that's what they do when they use a urinal because they never learned any different. So aim, aim for generalizable skills, watch out for unintentional effects like shaming people or getting them to like engage in, a, in an inappropriate behavior or a whole bunch in another setting because you're punishing it in one. Help them create their own self-regulation systems because eventually, yeah, everyone needs to be in charge of their own sexuality. Pornography, I will not go through, but it is about the worst thing you can do for sexuality is pornography. And if you don't teach, pornography will. Um, pornography gets bad, really bad. I have a student that her pornography addiction got to the point where she was like, it's not doing it for me anymore. I want to go do a bunch of one night stands because that's what I want to do. And then, of course, one night stands aren't doing it for her anymore. And again, she's going to be in huge trouble. And now she's thankfully in uh, a rehab program. Pornography is abuse and exploitation, okay? It just is. That's how it's created. That's how it's done. It's very similar. If you're dealing with pornography or porn addictions, there are recovery centers. There's 12-step programs. Um, Brain Lock is a book for obsessive compulsive disorder, but the system that they have there, and this is in your handout, is really good for helping to people with uh, pornography addictions, acceptance commitment therapy, things like that can be helpful. But I don't want to end on a negative. I want to end on some positives. If they want long-term romantic relationships, they can have them. They're going to have to build those social skills. They're going to have to learn the systems and run them and apply them and adjust them. They're going to have to deal with the anxiety and the rejection of, of connecting with other people. They're going to have to put in the time and the effort. They're going to have to watch out for safety and values. But guess what? Everybody does. That's the price of relationships. And if we want relationships, we're going to, have to be willing to pay those prices. And we can do it. They need to know how to tell if sex is appropriate. And by the way, this goes for any physical contact. This could be, is kissing appropriate? Is holding hands appropriate, right? This is the system I teach my students. Um, and again, this is a really useful system for any type of physical contact, but they need to have a system that they can use to evaluate. And I remember teaching this one week and having a student say, where was this last week? 
uh, they need to know that even if, you know, hey, they make it and they're getting married or they're in an appropriate sexual relationship, whatever their values may happen to be, they can have problems because of communication or intimacy or sensory issues or aversion to change. I, I get calls from couples where the wife is like, he's mad because I don't look the same as I did in our wedding pictures anymore. Or I, every time I change my hair, he freaks out and they're just not understanding the spouse's autism and the spouse with autism is not understanding how flexible they need to be. These are things that can be worked on, but they're there. Um, if they are really wanting to get married, helping them to understand all of those questions that are involved with that. Uh, I wish I had time to show you this video, but there's a great documentary out there called Autism in Love that goes over a bunch of couples and, and has a wonderfully cute epilogue where one of the couples gets married and how they dealt with, both of them are autistic, both of them have jobs, uh, both of them have a lot of issues and they got married and they talked about how they managed to navigate the wedding and make the, married, the wedding work and it's really sweet. So watch that when you get a chance. Give them resources. Again, not internet resources, but there are things, unless they're very, very carefully selected websites, right? But there are things out there, there's a bunch of resources in your handouts. And I want you to know you're gonna be all right because you're actually here. You're the parents who are caring about this. They're learning about this. They're wanting to take action with this. Your kids are gonna be way well, well ahead of all these kids who got sexually abandoned and nobody gave them any information. So don't give up hope. Um, the research shows that you can eliminate inappropriate sexual behaviors. And the research shows that individuals with developmental disabilities who receive sexual education are more likely to involve, engage in more appropriate sexual behaviors. And it's very, very clear. It just try, any kind of try is great. To summarize, start early and individualize, right? This is gonna have to be individualized to that person in that, that situation and cover the pieces you can. But again, you don't have to cover them all. You don't have to cover them all at once. Take it at the best pace possible for that person. Remember, whatever age disability or disability, how are you gonna use this? Because it's okay that you feel overwhelmed by this and uncomfortable. It's okay to feel embarrassed and silly. It's okay to start small. It's okay to be simple. It's okay not to be perfect at this or any aspect of parenting, but it is not okay to do nothing. That's been happening way too long for people with disabilities. So what are you going to do? Bring that in. Okay, so I'm sorry, we're about five minutes over, but I'm still happy to hang on for some Q&A if you guys wanna hang around. I understand if you need to leave, but thank you so much for your time. Feel free to contact me if you have um, some other things you'd like to talk about and I can refer you to people who may be able to help as well. Um, but thanks for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your Friday afternoon. Thank you so much, Jared. We do have some questions from the chat. First one here, um, I, my 13 year old has hit puberty. He's constantly touching himself or rubbing on things. He also tries to touch me inappropriately or hug me intimately and doesn't stop when asked. He doesn't ask others if he can touch or hug them either. He doesn't seem to understand boundaries and will say things like, but I love you, you're my mom. Yeah, and again, I can only give you very generalized advice. What I would I really recommend that you um, hire a behavior analyst uh, to work with that. But the kind of techniques that are used are the combination of antecedent interventions where you're helping to be aware in advance of those kind of behaviors and like being able to head them off in different ways. And there's a lot of different ways to do that depending on how the touching is going and that kind of thing. There are also interventions then that are designed to help educate as part of the antecedent. Again, those social stories that can be, you know, sometimes I really want to touch myself here or sometimes you know, I want to touch mommy in these areas, but when I do this, it makes mommy feel this way. And I, and, you know, or it's, you know, it's something that other people see this way. Again, I'm not an expert at writing those social stories, find a good behavior analyst who can help you with that kind of thing. And then the other thing you want to do is really differential reinforcement where help them find really healthy ways to get some really high stimulating touch, maybe not sexual necessarily, but other types of touches that can be really, really great uh, for them, help them find, um, and when, they're, when they do act appropriately or when they do talk appropriately, pour out that attention and give them lots of sincere praise and so forth. And when they're following those plans or following the thing that you taught them, that's there. But again, if you're experiencing that level at a 13 year old, I would definitely get professional help um, and insurance will cover BCBAs. So um, definitely something to, to look into there. I, I wish, again, I wish I could tell you more than that, but that's, that's a great place to start. There are online helps as well. Um, so if you check out some of those resources, uh, the Autism Speaks has a really good guide to inappropriate sexual behaviors that you can look at that's totally free. 
And there's others there in the resources as well. Great, thank you. We have another comment from the chat um, from a self-advocate who says, um, some things that have helped her was a limit on how long a hug is going to be and the visuals like pictures can really help. All right, that's what I'm talking about. And those are the systems, right, that I'm talking about. You need to learn your systems, whatever they are. And, you know, I'll have systems for how long I'm supposed to hug somebody or, or who I'm supposed to hug or, you know, how and when to touch and all that kind of stuff. And they're great and they're wonderful and they help me have wonderful relationships. And I've been married for 23 years. So, yay. Um, great. We have another um, question and comment in the chat, but I just saw that individual's hand raise. Um, would you like to unmute your microphone and share or would you like me to read from the chat? This is for Kira. I'm um, sorry. Um, I I am 17. Just just a disclaimer. I got onto this thing because I was looking for because I'm a self advocate. Because I got diagnosed when I was 15. I was very late, and how are I'm gonna be a bit of a if anyone knows Paige Laley, just stop me. Um, that. They use more of the dudes part to testing and it does get hard for me, especially with literally getting called on. I was live on Instagram today. I got two people saying the same exact thing I put in the chat. And I literally went off in like a very but I stay I kept my cool without crying and all that. I just yeah, just it really hurts, especially grade 10 and 11. It got really hard. And when I had to, when I did a thing for my school, because I didn't want to disappoint my teacher, which is she's still one of my favorites. I had to uh, speak about my autism in a video for my school. The week after that, I started getting massive bullying and quite a bit beaten up. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, Kira. That is, that, that's what I'm talking about with that trauma, right? And that PTSD that often comes out of the school system for us. I have depression, ADHD, anxiety as well. And having trauma back, but it's not beaten up. It's having three deaths, two of them involving cancer. The one that hit more was seven months before my graduation. It came my mother's mom, lung cancer. Two people died between four days, 2015. First was my stepdad's dad, passed away naturally. 24 hours before my mom's dad died, he found out he had liver cancer. So I can never really talk about that stuff or talk to anyone on Friday 13th because my Grammy died on one of those. And it's just been really hard just trying to get it all out and like the sexuality and stuff I've pretty much figured out. I've been on and off of LGBT stuff. I've been like five sexualities, just trying to figure myself out. It's just been hard. and It is very hard. I want you to know it's hard for everybody, but yeah, when you're feeling that it's this extra difficult for you, that's normal to feel. I want you to know that it's Yeah, and I don't do that. Please like what was said is just it gets really hard and I was glad to get that out some people who are on here that have the same issue yeah well I'm glad you were able to be here tonight and again if, if you need people to talk to I'm sure that there are people involved with this group who can help hook you up with therapists and there are groups out there that you can talk to I do it's just I had to get it out at this point thank you Okay. I'm gonna actually go. Have a great weekend, Kira. Sylvia, any others? No, we don't have any other questions in the chat, but you know, we if Jared, if you have just a moment, if anyone else would like to unmute or um, add a question before we wrap up, we're happy to to take that time. So yeah. Do you mentioned handouts in the slides. Where are those? Are those available for download or? Those are in the, they're in the chat and they also were emailed out. And if you need more, just email me at that address you see on your screen. 
Okay, I, I downloaded what appeared to be the PowerPoint. Is that is that? There was also a, there's also a handout there that's got a lot of resources on it. Okay, uh, Sylvia, did you provide that handout as well as the PowerPoint? Maybe I missed it. Oh, no problem. I did email it out. Um, oh, okay, so you emailed it. That's great. Then and I also just put it back in the chat. So there's a PDF that um, I just put in the chat, so it should be at the very bottom, just in case you missed the. First one. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck, you guys. Again, you're going to be okay. Don't neglect the issues and you're going to be fine. It's rocky stuff for everybody and it gets better uh, as long as you're giving it positive attention. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Happy Thanks. Easter. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great meeting you. We'll see you guys.